and this recording will discuss nephron physiology. So your nephron has three main functions, filtration, tubular reabsorption, and tubular secretion. We've briefly discussed filtration, which is literally just the process of forming filtrate at the glomerulus. We'll, we'll refresh ourselves on that. Tubular uh, reabsorption is basically taking solutes from the filtrate and putting them back into the paratubular capillaries. Um, so you're taking solutes from the filtrate and you're putting back into the blood where they technically originally came from. And then we have tubular secretion. Uh, which is removing substances from the paratubular capillaries, and we're going to put them into um, some part of the renal tubule. Okay, um, anything that remains in the tubule, okay, remember, will ultimately become part of the urine. Okay, so this is a, a another way to take certain solutes, certain substances from the blood, and um, put them in the urine to discard. Okay, so glomerular filtration, okay, this is where we are going to filter the blood at the glomerulus, okay, remember the glomerular capillaries, um, they're very leaky, they're fenestrated, but we've got those podocytes that create the filtration slits, so we're technically pretty selective about what can be filtered out of the blood and make its way into um, the Bowman's capsule. So large substances are not filtered and instead they remain in the blood. So we're talking things like red blood cells and white blood cells, um, blood proteins, okay, so your antibodies, um, albumin, things like that, okay. Usually those are too big to pass through the capillary walls, okay. So if you find any of those in your urine, that is a sign that something is going wrong, okay. But smaller things like sodium, potassium, hydrogen ions, bicarbonate ions, um, glucose, those kinds of things are small enough that they have no problem entering into the capsular space to become filtrate. Um, this also includes a couple of other substances like urea, um, ammonium, which we get those two from protein metabolism that we've mentioned previously. Creatine, which is produced by creatine kinase during um, muscle physiology, which we've mentioned that um, in previous lectures. And then uric acid, which is a byproduct of nucleic acid metabolism. Okay, so if you kind of think back to the metabolism lectures, okay, some of these terms hopefully will sound kind of familiar. Okay, now again, just to remind ourselves, the glomerular capillaries, they are fenestrated, um, and so they are kind of leaking, but the podocytes are what help um, create the filtration slits, so we do get to be a little bit more picky about what can actually be filtered and what can't. Um, filtrate is formed properly when your blood pressure is normal, okay? If your blood pressure is too low, Okay. Your JGA cells, your juxtaglomerular apparatus cells, are going to produce renin, which triggers the RAS system, and angiotensin II ultimately causes your arterioles um, to constrict. Okay. Um, so arterial constriction, vasoconstriction, obviously increases your blood pressure okay, um, to kind of raise everything back up to normal levels. Okay. Um, once we do this, then the hydrostatic pressure would increase so filtration can continue as normal. Okay? If your blood pressure drops too low and for whatever reason it remains too low, then filtrate will not be produced in adequate quantities and so um, you'll be making uh, too little urine. Okay? All right, so just to remind you, here's kind of what everything looks like. So. You've got your capillary back in the background. Your red cells, your white cells, platelets, albumin, things like that are too big to go through our filtration slits. Okay, but other smaller substances, um, sodiums, potassiums, can squeeze in between the podocytes and they can squeeze in between the filtration slits. So anything that ends up on this side will become part of the filtrate. Okay. All right. So we can actually measure some things here. The amount of filtrate that's formed by both kidneys in one minute, that is your glomerular filtration rate, your GFR. Okay. Um, on average, this is about 125 milliliters per minute. Okay. 
um, or the equivalent of filtering all three liters of blood plasma about 60 times per day. Okay, so remember ultimately your kidneys do filter um, all of your blood about 60 times per day. Okay, now two things that help um, drive that rate are both your hydrostatic pressure and your colloid osmotic pressure. Remember another name for your colloid osmotic pressure is your blood osmotic pressure. Okay. Um, your hydrostatic pressure, don't forget, is just basically your blood pressure. This is what's pushing fluids out of the capillary into the interstitial space or the capsular space. And then again, your colloid osmotic pressure, your blood osmotic pressure, your BOP. You all know I love the BOP. Okay. This is the pressure created by your uh, blood proteins like your albumin that pulls water back into the capillaries via osmosis. Okay. So these two pressures, we've seen them before, we've talked about them before. Um, last time we talked about them, we were talking about putting fluids into and bringing it back in just to the interstitial space and like your tissues. Now we're just specifically talking about the same two pressures, um, but now we're just talking about at your glomerulus instead, so the fluid would go into the Bowman's capsule or um, or not, okay? Um, do, do, do. So we've talked about net, net filtration pressure previously. Um, it's the same idea here. At your glomerulus, this is um, on average about 10 millimeters of mercury. That's pretty normal. The water um, moves out of the capillaries when your hydrostatic pressure is higher than your osmotic pressure. The water will move back in when the osmotic pressure is higher. So if we're going to have a net filtration pressure that's favoring filtration, um, then your overall your hydrostatic pressure would have to be larger. Okay. Now, tubular reabsorption. So this is gonna happen next, okay? We have created filtrate, okay? We just filtered, right? Now we're going to reabsorb. We're going to modify the filtrate as it goes through the renal tubule. You are going to reclaim and reabsorb useful substances like water, glucose, amino acids, electrolytes, okay? Uh, in fact, quite a bit of the materials found within filtrate will ultimately be reabsorbed. Your body will be like, eh, those are useful, let's hold on to them a little bit longer, okay? They'll all ultimately end up back into the blood where they can be uh, used later, okay? We love to reduce, reuse, and recycle, right? Your nephron is able to reabsorb um, most of the water that has been filtered and most of the solutes that have been filtered. And we do that along the entire length of the tubule, so both the proximal and distal convoluted tubules as well as, well as the loop of Henle. Those are all responsible for um, tubular reabsorption. And we can go into a little bit more detail. Um, so at the proximal tubule specifically, solutes are moving um, from the filtrate we're going to reabsorb those. What kinds of things are we going to reabsorb here? Um, a lot of things, y'all. 99%, 99% of what has been filtered, okay, so filtrate, is going to get reabsorbed, right? 99%. Your proximal tubules kind of busy, y'all. Um, water, sodium, amino acids, glucose, chlorine, bicarbonate, all kinds of things get reabsorbed at your proximal convoluted tubule. Okay. Water, okay, so of all the water in the filtrate, 60 to 70-ish percent of the water reabsorption occurs here at your proximal tubule. Okay. This is going to be coupled with sodium reabsorption as well, all right, so sodium will also see 60 to 70 percent reabsorption here. Okay. This water reabsorption is obligatory, okay? What does that mean? That means we are going to reabsorb that water regardless of whether we actually need it or not, okay? So you don't even have to be dehydrated. You're still going to reabsorb up to 70% of your filtered water. You're just gonna take it back up, okay? Why are we doing that? So we can help make sure we're not getting dehydrated, okay? Sodium, again, is the same. We're coupling that with the water reabsorption, so those numbers should be similar. Amino acids, 100% reabsorption, okay? What do we do with amino acids? We turn them into proteins. Okay. Where do we use proteins? All over the place, right? Structural proteins, contractile proteins, enzymes, um, antibodies. Those are all proteins that we can always use amino acids somewhere. Okay. 
Glucose, also 100% reabsorption normally, okay, normally. There is a limit though. So glucose reabsorption is also coupled with sodium reabsorption. Okay, we've already talked about sodium and water being related as well. But again, there is a limit. So you can only um, transport and reabsorb about um, 180 milligrams per 100 milliliter of glucose at a time. Okay, so if you have more glucose than this, okay, in your filtrate at any time, this is all you can reabsorb at once. So if you have, say, 190 milligrams per 100 milliliter, the other 10 milligrams are going to end up in the, uh, in the urine, so you have glucosuria, okay? Who normally suffers from that? Um, people with diabetes, okay? People with uncontrolled diabetes. So normally, you should not have glucose in your urine. Should be 100% reabsorption. Why? Because glucose is energy, right? We can turn this into ATP, and we always need ATP, right? But again, there is a limit. If you have too much glucose floating around, okay, in your filtrate, you can only reabsorb so much at a time, any excess will end up in your urine. Okay? Now, chlorine, this is also coupled with sodium reabsorption. You can um, also get rid of chlorine another way. You can lose both hydrogen and chloride or chlorine ions through vomiting, which can lead to alkalosis. Okay, so metabolic alkalosis. Um, the hydrogens, remember, um, are basically acids. Okay, so if you are vomiting excessively, you're getting rid of too much acid, and so you would become um, you would be suffering from an, a metabolic alkalosis. Okay. Now, bicarbonate ions, um, reabsorption here is, again, coupled with sodium. You see a, a trend here. Uh, it seems like everything's coupled with sodium. The, the reabsorption or secretion of bicarbonate helps maintain your blood pH. So if your blood is too acidic, okay, so if you are suffering from an acidosis, Okay, how do we fix that? One of the ways is to reabsorb our bicarbonate, which is acting as a base. So we can kind of go back to our normal blood pH. Now, if you are a solute that gets reabsorbed at your proximal tubule, here's the pathway you would take. You would go from your proximal tubule, you would be reabsorbed back into the peritubular capillaries, you would then move through the venules, the cortical radiate vein, the arcuate vein, the interlobar vein, and eventually you would end up back in the renal vein, and the renal vein um, would send blood next to the inferior vena cava.